thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure and honor being back here in uh, Seoul, Korea. I've been dozens of times to your great country, and I've also been attending and speaking uh, the World Norge Forum several times, so it's great to be here and have a chance to give you my outlook for the global economy. And of course, uh, looming in the market investors, the question of whether this economic slowdown is going to lead to another recession or another financial crisis. Now, if we look at the global economy for the last year or so, um, it's certainly a period of time that people define of a economic slowdown. And by economic slowdown, we mean uh, a period where growth is still positive, but is decelerating as opposed to accelerating. Between 16 and 18, uh, we had the economic expansion, acceleration of global growth, but uh, since the middle of last year, we had a deceleration. Uh, not only we have a deceleration, but if you're looking at some parts of the global economy, we're already in a recession. Uh, the manufacturing and industrial uh, sector are in a recession in Europe, in US, um, in Asia, in some emerging markets. Exports are down in many parts of the world, starting with Korea. And capital spending by the corporate sector, investment into new machinery and factories, has also fallen sharply in its most regions of the world. And that's not a surprise, because as I fully point out, one of the biggest global tail risks is the risk of a full-scale trade, currency, technology, and cold war between US and China. And therefore, if you are a corporation in the US, in Europe, in China, in Korea, and you have excess capacity, why would you want to build a new factory, spend billions of dollars if you don't know the, whether by the end of this year there'll be 30 or 40 percent tariff on all Chinese goods exported to the United States? So whenever there is this uncertainty about trade risk and protectionism, there is a, what economists refer to as the option value of waiting. There's uncertainty. You want to wait and see whether this trade war is going to escalate or not, and therefore. You don't want to make long-term investment decisions that are a sunk cost, and therefore it's better to wait, and therefore capital spending is down. So tradable are down, capital spending is down, manufacturing is down, technology is down. Why we don't have yet a global recession? Because whether you look in Europe, Europe, US, Korea, Japan, China, domestic demand is still growing okay. And within domestic demand, services and non-tradable are still growing and private consumption is still growing. So what's sustaining the global economy and preventing it from a recession is essentially private consumption. However, suppose hypothesis that by the end of the year, the trade war between China and US were to escalate, and the US were to impose a 25% tariff on the remaining $300 billion of Chinese exports to the United States. Most of those remaining $300 billion are consumer goods. The first 250 were mostly intermediate inputs. So if you're going to impose a 25% tariff on all consumer goods coming from China, those are the goods that the white blue collars buy at Walmart and other retailers, mostly goods from China. Uh, that's going to slow down sharply the growth rate of disposable income. Then there's a slowdown of consumption or a fall. And that could be the tipping point for a recession because it's going to trigger also falling consumption. So that's what's happening right now, and that's the main tail risk. So is there going to be a recession next year and a financial crisis? I think the answer to that question depends on what are the tail risks uh, in the global economy. And I'll point out that these tail risks are essentially three, the most important ones. All three of them are essentially negative supply shocks. It's important because during the global financial crisis, where the negative aggregate demand shock, while the shocks I'm going to talk about are not demand shocks, they're more supply. And why supply shocks are important? Because supply shocks are negative, reduces output, but also increases inflation, like, for example, trade and protectionism. And secondly, as I pointed out uh, in a recent piece that I wrote, uh, these shocks and these tensions are deriving from what I refer to as three major games of chicken between uh, uh, different powers around the world. What's a game of chicken? Uh, it's essentially, is a, in game theory, is an example uh, exemplified by two people that are driving a car, going against each other in a single lane kind of a road. And uh, if one of them swerves, uh, 
then looks like a wimp has chickened out. And because of pride that you want to save face, you don't want to swerve. And the other side, the same. So if one swerves and the other doesn't, then you look like a chicken and uh, you lose face. If instead, both of you, you don't want to do so, you continue, then you clash, and then both of you die. So those are the games of chicken. And there's one game of chicken is playing today between uh, US and China, i.e. between uh, President Trump and President Xi Jinping. Neither side wants to lose face and it could lead to an escalation of a trade, currency, technology, and Cold War. Uh, there is a second game, game of chicken is played by the United States and Iran on the conflict uh, in the Middle East and the Gulf that could lead to an escalation to a full hot war that could spike all prices. And there is a third one that is played in Europe between uh, Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, and the European Union that could lead to a hard Brexit with important consequences, not just for Europe, but through contagion also to other parts of the global economy. So I would say that in decreasing order of importance, US and China is the most important one. Uh, the US-Iran is also important for reasons I'm gonna explain. Uh, the one between UK and Europe uh, maybe doesn't have direct global consequences, but it can have contagion and spillover effects also to the global markets. And those are the main trade risks, and they're all negative supply shocks that are stagflationary because each one of them would reduce growth but would also increase inflation for reason i'll explain and they're all three games of chicken between different types of power now let me start from the first one as you know uh, one of the big uncertainties about the world is uh, the trade tensions between us and it's not about trade only it's also about technology and a broader cold war and rivalry between us and china and it could escalate. Already in the last few months, I've seen retaliation and increasing tariff on both sides and so on. Now, why this is important? It's important because for the last 30, 40 years, we have had, uh, since the opening up of China and then the collapse of the Soviet Union, an opening of the global economy. More trade, more migration, more globalization, more trade in goods, in services, in capital, labor, information, technology, data, and so on. But if if this tension between US and China were to escalate, we'll be beginning to see the opposite. Deglobalization, balkanization of global supply chains, first in technology, manufacturing, and industry. We'll have a fragmentation of the global economy. We'll have a decoupling between US and China. Now, when there was the conflict with the Soviet Union, it didn't matter because US and Soviet Union were not making much trade with each other, uh, almost nothing and uh, the Soviet Union was a small economic power compared to China. So decoupling of US and China has much more of an impact. And we could have a reverse of, of globalization. What are the restricting, restrictions to trading goods, in services, to capital? Chinese investment in US has fallen by 90%. Uh, migration, US wants to impose restrictions to even Chinese students and scientists coming to the United States. And restriction, of course, to technology, data, and information. This is the beginning of deglobalization. Now, why, why is it important? It's important because today the fight might be about 5G and whether Huawei is going to be restricted from uh, selling telecoms and 5G networks in Europe or around the world. But tomorrow, these 5G networks are going to be driving not only uh, compu uh, smartphones and telecoms, but they're going to also be driving autonomous vehicles uh, systems that are going to be driving and managing critical civilian infrastructures. And in a world in which you have uh, 5G, you have also a world of IoT, Internet of Things, where you have billions of devices that are connected to each other. So tomorrow, every Chinese uh, toaster or every Chinese coffee machine or every Chinese uh, <coughs> uh, microwave will have a 5G chip. And if the US fears, and may be right or wrong that those are listening devices, then once you restrict the 5G of Huawei, you can restrict every consumer good. You know, even this bottle might have a 5G chip that is used to have GPS monitoring over where it's going, and it could become a listening device. So you start with a technology war, but that technology war implies that you're gonna spill over and restrict trade to every type of consumer goods, even a small toaster. So you can see how a tech war can lead then to a full-scale trade war and then you have a full decoupling, balkanization, fragmentation, deglobalization. And it'll be dramatic because uh, 
most countries in the world today, actually those that are allies of United States <coughs> in Asia, like uh, Korea, Japan, or in Europe, or in the Middle East, or in Latin America, most of the US allies uh, geopolitically are doing today more trade and investment with China than they're doing with the United States. And tomorrow, the US is gonna say, it's either our, our 5G or the Chinese 5G, and the Chinese are gonna say either my 5G or the American, it's either my AI or your AI, my robotic and automation or yours, and that's gonna be putting a squeeze to countries like Korea, Europe, and many others who do business and trade with the United States and do business and trade also with China. So both sides are gonna ask you, be with me or be against me, and that's gonna create severe economic problem. And we're already seeing the damage that, for example, the current trade friction with the US and China are imposing on the Korean economy where exports now have sharply fallen for the last uh, 10 months because of this trade tension. And the escalation of this is gonna make things worse. So, so if we're gonna have a full-scale trade and technology war, it's the beginning of deglobalization. You'll have lower potential growth, you'll have higher inflation as the import prices through tariff protection and restriction of technology are gonna increase the price of every good and service. That's why this is something very serious if it were to happen. Second risk uh, is the risk of a full-scale hot war between US uh, and Iran. In the last uh, few months, actually, oil prices had fallen for a while because they were worried about the global recession. In the global recession, there'd be less demand for all goods and oil, and therefore oil prices were falling. But it took an accident, a low-tech attack using drones against uh, a US oil facility to cut off for a few weeks, maybe months, almost half of the Saudi production. We're not speaking about high-tech weapons, just a bunch of drones with bombs on it, okay? And if there was a full-scale, of course, hot war between US and Iran, uh, then you could have a block of the Strait of Hormuz, and you'll have a spike of oil prices to 100 or $120 a barrel, and gasoline prices in the US of 4 or $5 a gallon. And of course, many other countries in the world are net energy importer. Korea, China, most of Europe, Turkey, India, many other emerging markets. The only beneficiary will be some of the oil exporters. Now, most of you in this audience I see, are you, are, you're young enough, uh, enough not to remember, but there was a young teenager when in 1973 there was the Yom Kippur War between US, uh, between Israel and the Arab states. Following that war, there was an oil embargo, oil prices tripled, and you had in 74, 75, stagflation, recession and inflation, double digit inflation. 1979, you had the Iranian Revolution. Again, another oil embargo, oil prices double, another recession, 8082 in US and globally. And even the 1990 91 recession in the United States and globally was driven in part by the June 1990 Iraq invasion of Kuwait that led to another spike in oil prices. So you already had in the last uh, few decades three major global recessions and spikes in inflation, negative supply shocks that were driven by a geopolitical shock in the Middle East that led to a spike in oil prices. People say today US has shale gas and oil, depends less on Middle East, it's true. Uh, but if oil goes above $100 per barrel, first everybody else in the world that is net oil importer like you guys are gonna hurt. And even US, the profits of oil producers go up, but every consumer is gonna have a squeeze in its income and that's gonna collapse consumption. So on that, even the US, even today, would suffer from a major oil shock. So an oil shock has the ability, even today, even with weaker OPEC, even with shale gas and oil, of tipping the US and the global economy into a recession. Uh, and it's a negative supply shock that reduces growth and causes a rise in inflation. The third shock maybe is European rather than global, the risk of a hard Brexit between the UK and European Union, but it could have global effects. First of all, if there's hard Brexit, it's not just the UK is gonna have a recession. Europe is on the verge of a recession. Germany is almost in a recession. Italy is. Germany, Ireland, Belgium, Netherlands export a lot to the United Kingdom. And business confidence in Europe is already negative because of the worries about US and China protectionism and war. So the last thing that European can afford is to see long lines of thousands of trucks blocked on one side in Calais in France, on the other side in Dover, UK, and then there'll be a collapse in business confidence that tips the European economy into a recession. If Europe goes into a recession, Chinese is hurt, Asia is hurt, US is hurt, you'll have a risk of episode with global 
equity market having a downturn, and that's how the contagion, the spillover can occur. Now, you could say there is some good news because uh, even if there's a negative supply shock, this time around, central banks are going to ease monetary policy, and they're doing so. The Fed, the ECB, other central banks, and they're easing rather than raising rates because in spite of this uh, shock leading to higher inflation, it leads to lower growth. And since inflation is low, inflation expectations are low, central banks can afford to ease rather than raising rates like in the 70s. The shock is a negative supply shock, but in the short run, is also a demand shock. Capital spending is down because of the option value of waiting. And if they have import prices going up, then you'll have also a reduction in consumption. So it's a combination of a supply and negative shock. That's why in the short run, monetary and fiscal policy gets eased rather than being tightened. However, if these shocks were to occur and become permanent, in the medium term, monetary policy cannot undo a negative permanent supply shock, reduces potential growth, and raises inflation. In the 70s, when we accommodated those negative supply shock, we ended up with high inflation, double digit, with unsustainable debts and deficits. So while in the short run, central banks and fiscal policy can come to the rescue of economy hit by this negative supply shock, in the medium term, if you accommodate them and you finance them, you get inflation, deficits, and a sustainable debt accumulation because these are permanent negative supply shocks that cannot be undone through monetary or fiscal policy. So in the short term, the response is to ease, but in the medium term, you cannot ease, you cannot finance them. You have to adjust to them by accepting a lower growth, otherwise you get more macroeconomic instability. Final observation I'll make is, what's the likelihood of these shocks materializing? Because of course, if they do not materialize, this mediocre new normal of low growth is going to stay, but we're going to avoid a recession and a financial crisis. I would say that in the case of US and China, uh, there are three scenarios. One scenario is a full deal, where then you roll back all the tariffs and you have an agreement on everything. I would say it's unlikely. The two sides are too far apart. Uh, the other extreme will be a full-scale trade war, where you have 30 40% tariff on all Chinese exports, retaliation by China, and a total technology war where Huawei doesn't get an exemption. Uh, that might not be the baseline scenario, but I would say the most likely scenario is that you reach only a pseudo deal. There is a truce. Maybe the US imposes some extra tariffs on the Chinese goods, but not a full escalation. Maybe the Chinese buy some agricultural goods from the US. Maybe they agree on something like intellectual property rights, but Trump cannot go and say the big win, and therefore is subject to attacks by Democrats who say, you thought you fought China, but you got a mediocre deal, and that deal can fall apart. So even a truce implies that the current tariff remain in place, probably they slightly increase, but you don't have a full escalation, and that will be quite negative for growth. Maybe not tipping you in a full recession, but you're close to it. So I would say you're lucky if you get a truce, you're not gonna get a full deal, and a truce can end up in the full scale war if then a deal unravels because it can unravel because both sides don't stick to it. So I would say the situation between US and China is still quite risky and it can escalate as in any game of chicken where both sides don't want to lose face, both sides are difficult to compromise, even if US needs a deal for Trump to be elected and the Chinese need a deal because they want to avoid the slowdown of growth that is excessive. Uh, between US and Iran, again, rationality will imply that neither side would want a full war because a full war implies high oil prices in the US and Trump loses election, and it means a destruction of the uh, Iranian economy and its civilian military infrastructure. But the escalation has continued. Both sides are provoking each other. It takes one accident, like US attacking Iran because of a recent provocation, then uh, Iranians uh, counterattack, and then you have a full-scale war, and you have a block of the Straits, and all goes to a $100 barrel. So I would say that those kind of frictions are going to remain and can escalate in a full-scale war in the next few months. We are not out of the woods. Uh, same thing in Europe. Uh, people say there may be a compromise between the two sides because both UK and, and Europe are going to hurt from hard Brexit, but we don't have any deal. There's an October 31st deadline. Maybe there'll be an extension. Maybe there will not be. Maybe there will be elections. Maybe Boris Johnson wins those elections and then plays hardball with Europe, and therefore you cannot rule out, I would say, at least a 50% probability that uh, 
that the hard Brexit is going to occur. So on each one of these tail risks, you can tackle a more optimistic scenario where eventually rationality is going to be achieved. Both sides are going to start to talk. They're going to reach a compromise. Both sides say face. So nobody's losing face and turns out to be perceived as a chicken. But uh, every side is posturing. Trump is posturing with Xi. Boris Johnson is posturing with the EU. And US is posturing with Iran. And unless you, both sides have a compromise, then you have an outcome where you have a collision. A collision leads to an economic recession. And in a world in which too much debt, corporate debt, private debt, sovereign debt around the world, after the global financial crisis, we have more debt than before in the private public sector. You could have debt crisis in the private and the public sector. And final point, compared to the global financial crisis, we have less policy bullets. We have more constraints to monetary policy, more constraints to fiscal policy, more constraints to the ability of government to backstop and bail out private sector agents like corporates, households, and the uh, banking system. So if another crisis were to occur, compared to the global financial crisis where we had massive monetary fiscal stimulus and backstopping and bailout of the private sector, this time around will be more constrained and therefore an economic crisis could end up into a financial crisis. So at the end of the day, there are these three major geopolitical or geoeconomic risks, US China, US Iran, and EU or UK that determine the fate of the global economy and of financial markets and things that next year can turn out to, for the better, in which case we avoid a recession, or could they turn, turn out in the worst, in which each one of these shocks alone, let alone all of them together, could imply severe economic crisis and also a financial crisis. So maybe I'll stop here and maybe we can continue it in the conversation. Thank you for your attention. Thanks. The World Knowledge Forum.